Chapter 3 September 9th, 1983 The more I look, the more I see the monstrous nature of high school. Specifically, Hawkins High. Here's the paradoxical problem. Either you fall into the deadly trap of trying to be like everybody else, or you get devoured for being different. Two days after Sheena tries to leave the band room, I catch her at her locker. Every few days, it cascades with items that people have shoved in through the slits in the metal. White glitter. Nasty notes. Condoms. Today, she's blinking at her textbooks, shaking her head. She tries to open one of them, but she can't. Some bottom dweller took them to the wood shop cut them in half, and glued them back together. Who even has time to do things like that, I mutter. Then I rushed forward to help her. Sheena, I say, but she either doesn't hear me or doesn't want my pity. She's already moving fast toward the far end of the hallway, where she dumps the textbooks into the trash. A teacher catches her and gives her detention for ruining school property. That teacher, Miss Garvey, escorts her to the principal's office, putting a hand on Sheena's shoulder and saying in her gentlest voice, things like this wouldn't happen if you made it just a smidgen easier for people to understand you. Sheena? I'm a smidgen away from throwing up on Miss Garvey's shoes. I think about going straight to the principal and telling him everything I just saw. But would he care? Or would I just end up in detention with Sheena for pointing out that this school is rife with delinquents? The answer is self-evident. So instead of fighting the, the many-headed monster that is Hawkins High, I leave. There's no field practice on Fridays, and our first game of the season isn't until next week. The second, the second after the last bell rings, I grab my bike out of the rack. It used to belong to my mom. It's covered in her, her older flower decals. And the handlebars end in the sad, stubby remains of streamers that I pulled out when I was 13. It had a single speed, and every day it has to rub shoulders with a bunch of shiny 10-speed huffies and schwins. I climb on the banana seat, ouch, every time, and fly away. Riding around by myself is the best feeling in the world. As a bonus, the breeze makes my hair wing out behind me, and I can't smell my perm anymore. The sidewalk ticks beneath my tires, square after square. The trees are thickly green and the houses starched white. As I bike down a smooth stretch of sidewalk, I reach for my Walkman and turn it on. I don't have to check what's in there. It's always loaded with my language tapes. French tape, side one. Weather clicks on. Le temps, le temps, le tempit, le tempit, la brise, la brise. I'm getting into a good rhythm when a car speeds by away from high school, honking at me. I jolt out of the, out of the moment and nearly eat pavement. I put a hand to my Walkman. It's fine, but it could have been dropped and shattered, and I would have no way to listen to the language tapes that I begged my parents to buy me in eighth grade from an infomercial, no less. I ride expertly, no hands on the handlebars. Both middle fingers raised with a smile. Choke on diesel, I shout. Die, loser, someone shouts back. So nonspecific, I push down on my pedals and stand up to shout before they're out of range. You need a comeback, coach. I don't know who's driving. They probably didn't see who I was either. The mere fact that they're in a car and I'm on an ancient bike is enough. Power dynamic. Established. Loser. Apparent. But it's not really about winners and losers. 
We all live in a small town in Indiana. There's nothing big or shiny to win. I think people know that, even if they don't want to admit it, which means spitting on people, literally or metaphorically, is just another way to pass the time. I fully believe that if we lived in a place where we had things to do, things that mattered, my middle fingers would get less of a workout. But I live in Hawkins. If I stay long enough, I'm going to become the Jane Fonda of middle fingers. My hands wrap around the handlebars again. I add a few dings for my metal bell just in case the jerk who passed me is still paying attention. I keep riding to the outskirts of town where there are more clouds than cars. The day is pristine, but taking the long way past the fields and around the quarry is starting to turn on me. It gives me time to think about how the horror show of a popular kid in that car is just one of the monster's many claws. Its reach goes way beyond the school itself, which means I'll never be able to escape it, not while I live here. But there's nothing I can do about that. I'm stuck in town, so normal that it, that it actually hurts. A town where normal has grown teeth. By the time I get home, I'm ready to to let some of this frustration out. I pull the, the spare house key out from its hiding place under a, under a planter. And as I let, let myself in, I'm already yelling, I can't believe you voluntarily chose to live here. My mom is dancing around the living room in a crocheted sweater that cuts off around her belly button, worn tight over a long flowing dress. She's got her eyes closed, fingers snapping. Most of the time when I get home, she's still at work, and I just let myself into an empty house. But today, she's home early. You can't believe what, honey. A record is turning on its carved wooden stand, letting, letting out the predictable sounds of a plan of voice, insisting that if someone doesn't love them now, they never will. Mom is stoned at 4 p.m. and listening to Fleetwood Mac. I can't believe you chose to live here, I say. Those words are so pointed, Robin, she says in a whisper tone. Can't you start again from a place of peace? When she starts speaking in mantras, I know I'm not getting an answer. Usually, I'll drop this topic on the shag carpet, find myself a snack, and go to my room to get my homework out of the way so I could work on what I actually like. Languages. I'm up to four so far. English, Spanish, French, Italian. And I want to be fully fluent in, in each of them before I start adding more. But something about starting down the rest of sophomore year is starting to mess with my head. And the normal routine just won't do. I go over to the record player and turn the volume down. Mom flicks her eyes open. She doesn't like when someone, well, when anyone disrupts her records. She worries about scratching them as much as other people would worry about hurting a friend's feelings. Did you know that, that they created this song by splicing together pieces of, of other songs? She asks in a hyper-impressed, dreamy sort of state. You'd think Fleetwood Mac single-handedly, quintuply handle, handled, brought about world peace. Did you know that they've had two albums since rumors came out? Neither of those is nearly as good, she says. Robin Baby, you know how I feel about this. People are obsessed with new. I really do know what she means. Everyone at school gobbles up new fashions, new fads, new technology. Milton obsessively collects anything that can play new wave from guitars to eight tracks. Dash owns a dozen gray V-neck sweaters that he swears are different brands, even though they look exactly the same on his skinny frame. And he's got a pair of preptastic Sperry topsiders for every day of the week. Kate is only allowed to own things she can wear to church, which means she's blown five years worth of allowance on a secret wardrobe that she keeps stuffed in her gym locker at school. 
Right now, she's collecting overpriced lace headbands because she wants to look like some new pop singer with a severely Catholic name. The Odd Squad are pretty tame examples. Actually, Tam and her friends seem to have a new tube of lipstick or shade of eyeliner every day. And don't give me a megaphone and ask how much Steve Harrington must spend on hair product and chunky unflattering sunglasses because people will hear about it all the way in Michigan. Everything in our lives is supposed to be shiny, store-bought, or sickening expensive. All three is the holy trinity. Another thing the high school monster is good at, constant, ever faster consumption. I'm not even trying to keep up. I love the flaking paperbacks that I find at the library book sale. The only pieces of technology I own are an off-brand Walkman for my language tapes and a Polaroid camera that Kate gave me for my birthday last spring, which I suspect was her old model because she had a newer, shinier 8mm. Most of my clothes are vintage or hand-me-downs from various cousins. Not actual cousins, but the kids of mom and dad's hippie friends. And they have a lot of kids. I happen to agree with mom on this. But there is another side to the argument. You and dad are a little too invested in old stuff. It was made in the 60s. You immediately think it's sacred. You know you can't actually worship macrame and lava lamps, right? Mom crosses her arms and squints at me, her groovy state grinding to a halt. Seriously, how did you two complete flower children end up stranded in Hawkins, Indiana? I ask, plopping down on the carpet, tucking my feet under me. It's progeny versus parent. And I'm going to stay right here until she, until she coughs up the truth. You really need to know, Mom asks. I really do. I don't ask Mom and Dad a lot of questions. Or if I do, they're usually rhetorical. I don't demand answers. I've always been an easy child, as Mom calls me. Going along with things, never kicking up trouble. Maybe it's the novelty at this moment that makes her suspicious. Or maybe she doesn't like talking about her past unless it's on her own terms. What for? School project, I say with a shrug, about our origins? I'm good at thinking on my feet. Have I mentioned that? Mom laughs and swirls her bracelets around to the high-pitched cooing of you making you make loving fun. Your origin was in the back of a VW van after this one particular magical night on the Oregon coast. I put my hands firmly over my ears, jumped to my feet, and removed myself from this blatantly unacceptable situation. In my room, I throw on my metallic headphones and click the Walkman back. On French side, tape two, side one. Greetings and goodbyes. Come on! But the soothing monotone of the woman's voice saying, Bonjour, salut, coucou, allô, au revoir. Je suis désolé, mais je dois y aller. Bonjour, salut, coucou, allô, au revoir. Je suis désolé, mais je dois y aller. Just isn't doing it right now. I turn to my limited selection of actual music and put on Stevie Nicks' solo album, Belladonna, to compete with Mom's eternal Fleetwood Mac. It's a small act of rebellion, but it scratches the itch. I skip straight to the uber-dramatic opening, to Edge of Seventeen. The music spills over me as I fling myself down on the carpet. I stare at the ceiling. The ceiling stares back. I'm stuck here, definitively stuck, and I don't know what to do. Stevie Nicks is her gravely way. Stevie Nicks in her gravely way is reminding me that I'm not anywhere near 17. There's something kind of there's there's some kind of hope in 17. Some promise of adventure that I can only dream about. Past that 18 is waiting and freedom and the rest of my life. I'm only 15 and a half. 
Nobody sings about that. And I'll read chapter four very soon.